I'm Diane Smith. For about a dozen years now, you've joined me in searching the highways, byways, and waterways of this wonderful state of Connecticut, looking for the stories about the people and places that give it character and heart and tradition that make our corner of New England great. Stories that are Positively Connecticut. Join me now as Positively Connecticut finds a new home on the only channel with Connecticut as its first name, Connecticut Public Television. A pleasant walk in the Litchfield Hills is something many of us enjoy at this time of the year. But earlier in this century, and for 200 years before that, it wouldn't have made a very nice outing. That's because the land was stripped of trees and the air was thick with charcoal smoke. Picturesque village greens. Carefully tended homes. Fields framed by rolling wooded hills. The serenity of northwest Connecticut's Litchfield County where wildflowers flank country streams and winding rivers tumble over waterfalls as children scramble to net crayfish in the shallow waters of the Blackberry River in East Canaan. A time traveler would not recognize the place today, according to Ron Jones. No, if they had come in their horse and buggy to look at this area 100 years ago, they would not have seen trees up on Canaan Mountain or indeed any of these other places around because they were cut down for charcoal. Charcoal to fuel blast furnaces like this one that turned local ore into iron. Jones is one of the area residents working to preserve one of the last blast furnaces to send plumes of smoke into the sky. This is the remains of the Beckley furnace, named for the man who built it. There were more than 40 furnaces in the whole area. The streams were polluted from the, just the things being thrown into it and noise pollution. Ron Jones is working with industrial historian Ed Kirby of Sharon to preserve the legacy of Litchfield's era of iron. The iron industry was a, a major factor in this area for 200 years, almost 200 years. It started in 1731 with the discovery of iron ore over in Salisbury, and uh, they made utensils and things around here until 1925. In Kirby's book, Echoes of Iron, he calls the area the arsenal of the American Revolution. Well, over in Salisbury, uh, at the furnace that was built by Ethan Allen and the Forbes brothers and John Hazeltine, uh, uh, they made iron there uh, uh, in 1762. And then when the war broke out, when the revolution broke out, uh, they were producers of cannons. And 42% of all the cannon made uh, for the revolution for the colonists were made right there at that one single furnace. Just down the road from the furnace is the final resting place of Samuel Forbes. One of the giants in the industry, he came to be known as the Iron Prince, and he must have been quite a man. The stories about him are legion, including the one that he was so tough, he washed his hands in molten iron. From the mid-1700s through World War I, Men like Milo Barnum and Leonard Richardson developed an iron empire here. By the late 1800s, their foundry in Lime Rock became the biggest producer of railroad car wheels in the world. But it would not last. Steelmaking in Pennsylvania was edging out Connecticut-made iron, and by 1923, the last of the Litchfield blast furnaces closed, ending Connecticut's era of iron after nearly two centuries. The iron masters who labored here and the buildings that surrounded this furnace are long gone. The Beckley furnace itself barely survived, though it was declared Connecticut's only industrial monument in the 1940s. State funding came just in time to rescue this bit of history. What you're looking at is you're looking at a, the round hearth, the crucible down here where the iron, as it came down, got melted and then came out here, they would tap it out here, they would plug this up until they had enough iron, and then they would let the iron run out here and out onto that floor, and they would make pig castings out of that. 92-year-old Fred Hall, Canaan's town historian, is one of the last people to have seen the Beckley furnace in operation. As a boy, he visited with his father, a blacksmith, called in to make a repair. It was 1915, but he still vividly recalls the iron men at work. So I went down and watched them tap the furnace, saw that molten iron coming out of there, and I remember being terrified. That, uh, I was fairly close to it. I could feel the heat, of course, from where I was standing. 
Less than a decade later, the blast furnaces were silent as steel replaced iron. Although a Connecticut man won the rights to the Bessemer steelmaking process developed in England, he took his business to Pennsylvania. And his friends here said, you know, this is a great economic advantage for Pittsburgh. Why didn't you bring it back to Connecticut? And his answer was, it was because I love Connecticut. I want Connecticut to be the green hills we have today. The end of the era of iron allowed the industrial scars to heal. Today, buildings like this iron company's paymaster's office are homes for people seeking the bucolic beauty of the region. People would come and look at it from all different places and say, yes, the furnace should be saved. It is a symbol of this old heritage that we have, and it's a very special symbol because it reminds you of the days when this was industrial area and not the beautiful area of the Litchfield Hills it is today. The Beckley Furnace, a symbol of a time gone by that was positively Connecticut. Making the world a little bit better for somebody else, the staff, volunteers, and founders of Fidelco share a passion for helping people. This is New England's only guide dog agency. Periodically, I will have...